course. Uh, we have to rebalance in this condition. Yeah. Uh, but that should be enough. Well, you, you, can, you can start and stop that any time you want to. Yeah. Okay. I'm rolling 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good capture. That should be enough. Well, good morning. It's the 5th of April, 1995. We're here today for the International Photographers Guild with a distinguished cinematographer and Academy Award winner, Mr. John Toll. Hello, John. How are you? Good morning. How are you? I wanted to show off that Academy Award. That was really nice you got the other day. It was terrific. Pretty exciting. Yeah. That's what I came home with uh, last Monday evening. And uh, I'm the first to admit that I was uh, surprised that uh, my name was eventually called by Paul Newman after uh, uh, he sort of forgot the name off for the nominees. But in any event, I was... Uh, I was very surprised and, uh, to say the least, uh, excited about winning. It was as good a feeling as I've experienced in my life. With your clothes on. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> it's, uh, it was the top. I, uh, I never thought I'd uh, be able to say that, but it was the uh, all-time best experience. Well, congratulations. We'll talk more about that uh, in our interview as, as we get onto it. But first off, thank you for allowing us into your home for part of our oral history. Right. No, I think this is a great idea. This is looking forward to seeing some of the other ones after I uh, great. After we finish this. Well, what we usually do is start off a little bit of personal history. Um, and what we start off with was, where are you from? Are you, where are you from, John? I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, oh. and uh, went to high school there. Whereabouts? And where in Cleveland, Ohio? Yeah. A place called Euclid High School. Euclid High School. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, grew up. And when I left, when I was 19, left Cleveland, came to LA with the idea of uh, trying to get into the film business. Had you, had you been, um, what interested you? When I was, you, when I you was always there? interested in still photography as a kid. And did you do still photography? It just as a hobby. As nothing a hobby. professionally and nothing too serious, but uh, always somehow with the uh, belief that I would uh, wind up in photography as a uh, vocation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my mind, I wanted to uh, be a motion picture photographer. So you had that in your head pretty early on? Yes, and I, uh, for no reason other than uh, I just thought it would be a great idea. It was a great fantasy. Uh huh. And but uh, early on, though, you started learning what a lens did and what a f stop Not really. I mean, it you didn't study too much, no? Not, no, not really. It was just very superficial. It was really uh, uh, more basic than that. I uh, worked in dark rooms. I uh, went, took classes at the YMCA and, and, and learned uh, just basic uh, basic photography and how to make prints in a dark room. And, and well, that's good information, though. I mean, yeah, no, no, it's absolutely essential. It's the same principles you make making prints for motion pictures. Yeah, sure. I mean, same principles, that's quite the same yeah. thing. So I came here when I was 19 and with absolutely no idea how to, about how to go about attempting to get into business and was very unsuccessful at it. And uh, was, this was a time when there was still a draft, a uh, military draft in this country, and I was about to get drafted into the Army. So I went into the Navy and became a Navy still photographer. Well, that's that fed well into your background then. I mean, that, uh, uh, did you get some training then? Did they review? I went to Navy uh, basic photography school in Pensacola, Florida, and, and learned the theory of photography. I mean, it's it's a really it's a it's a great school. You really do learn the basic fundamentals uh, of photography, and uh, four by five speed graphics and darkroom work, and basic black black and white still photography is what that's. Well, how did you do that? You took a test and qualified. Yeah, I went in and take a, a test and say, what would you like to do? And I said, I want to be a photographer, and there it was, I wound up there. And wow. it's, it's sort okay. of been a pattern somehow in, in my life that I've had an idea of where to go. I just went in that direction and uh, eventually wound up there. I mean, it's just, it's been, it's been a pattern in the business. It's, it, uh, where I've wound up in the business is, is always, has been directed, uh, I have a 
eventually wound up there. It may have been a, uh, a winding path to, to get there, but it's, uh, I wound up there. Last Monday night was sort of like uh, something that was always a fantasy, and here we are. There you got there. Well, we'd we be talking to you regardless because you, you, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> so that's, that has nothing to do with that award. Um, you know, that was, that's a nice thing. Um, so you're uh, now in the service. You're uh, in your early yeah, so I, yeah. So I went to uh, uh, Navy Photo School. Uh, was there for four years. Not in school for four years. Was in the Navy for four years. Worked in primarily in, uh, uh, did a lot of lab work, both shot stills and did lab work. Uh, set up a color lab, kind of taught myself color photography, color printing, yeah. and uh, got out and decided that I wanted to go to college. I was never interested in college as a high school kid, but uh, getting out in my early 20s, I decided that college would be a good idea. Not really knowing what it was for, I just felt a need uh, for an education. So this would have been, what, the mid to, um, to late, late 60s? 60s? Okay. Late 60s, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happened then? You went to college? Went to school, came back to L.A. Uh -huh. Still with the idea that uh, making films would be, uh, would, would be a great idea. Always with the idea that I wanted to be a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. But felt a need for uh, more education than I had. So I went to school here. Where'd you go? Went to L.A. City College and to Cal State L.A. Mm -hmm. And studied uh, basically uh, humanities and social sciences. Nothing to do with the talk here, though. No. no. Only because I really felt a need for a basic education that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, and I, I considered going to film school and talking to people, and, and film school just didn't seem uh, what, didn't seem like what I needed. And I needed to learn more than how to make films. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to study, uh, have, a, have a better background in general education. So I, had a, I got a degree in political science. And I just sort of accidentally wound up there. It wasn't by design. It just is where I wound up. From it's Cal State? LA. LA. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, that's the Vermont uh, campus? That's, city, that's LA City College. Cal State LA is in uh, East LA. OK. Well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't know where it was. Right. But very fortunately for me, while I was going to college, I got a job working at uh, a phone company. So there was always this sort of parallel existence happening it was always the idea that uh, I wanted to go to school, but I wanted to stay in touch with the world of photography. Who did you work for? I worked at David Wolper's company. Oh, good. And they were doing documentaries. Yeah. Uh, this, they were doing, actually, this is, they were really doing wonderful documentaries in the uh, late 60s. Uh, so I had the opportunity to go there. I got a job as a PA through a relative. Mm -hmm. Got a job working as a PA in their production department part time. And uh, eventually became an assistant cameraman working on documentaries there. Mm -hmm. And came into contact with some really wonderful people, great filmmakers that were there. John Alonzo was going through there at the time. Uh, okay. You want, you want to stop her? E well, she's doing the dishes. Yeah, why don't you cut for a second? Okay, hold on for a second. First and last. Uh, okay. We're rolling. Right. Right. Yes. John, we're back here. Yeah. Sorry for that. Uh, we got the, the audio. Problem straight out, Joyce went home. So I got this job working at David Wolper's company. Wolper was busy at the time. Yeah, he was doing really good network documentaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people working there. And he was doing his own shows as well as <coughs> they had an association with National Geographic was there and Jacques Cousteau was there. And uh, there were a lot of different uh, groups of people working through his company. Mm -hmm. And some of the cameramen that were there, Alan Davio was went through there and John Alonzo did. I actually didn't meet John or Alan at the time, but uh, it was just, it was a great introduction to the film business for someone who wanted to get into it. And I think documentaries is a, is a wonderful foundation for anybody who's interested in the film business. I think it's something that everybody should do at one point. So you, so you were being a PA for them and, and you made- Yeah, I was a PA, but always in the, with the idea that I wanted to get into camera. Mm -hmm. And they owned three 16 millimeter cameras that weren't very well maintained, and they were sort of like in boxes in the basement. And when they get a, a, a documentary shoot come through, they would somebody would dig out the two NVRs and the RES, and off they'd go, and then they'd come back and in worse shapes. Yeah. So 
I started maintaining the cameras, even though I never really had much experience with uh, motion picture cameras as opposed to still cameras. I kind of figured it out, and uh, uh, what I didn't know, I asked. And well, if you tighten it up a little bit here and there, add a little oil, they work wonders. Well, so uh, so I became an assistant cameraman, uh, doing documentaries for them. Great. And uh, which was my introduction into the world of cinematography. Wonderful way to go about doing it. So. Uh, and I just consider myself to be very fortunate, really. And I, I worked, there was a cameraman there named Phyllis Lapinix, who uh, was uh, a, a fantastic cameraman, and probably one of the best uh, documentary cameramen ever. I think he was, uh, he was Lithuanian, right? And... Vilnius? Uh, Vilnius. V-I-L-I-S. Lapinix. And Vilnius uh, was... Warper was all non-union. Billis had come from Lithuania, and just on the strength of his talent, had got work here. And uh, he was somebody that I came into association with, and I'll never forget Billis just because of the nature of uh, his personality and his work. He was just the, the uh, he wanted to cast uh, an absolute wild, uh, crazy documentary cameraman, willing to risk his life, you know, to get a great shot. This was Billis, and. Uh, I didn't really see Villas as the uh, perfect role model, but he certainly was an example of uh, uh, the passion of, uh, uh, that uh, some people carrying in this business, and I thought he was fantastic. So I would work with him. And uh, now you'd be his official camera assistant, and you'd be loading the film. And <coughs> really yeah, but on a documentary, it's certainly a different uh, uh, type of work uh, than it is. On a feature. Well, you basically, you load magazines, make sure that all the gear is there, and you keep the camera running, and you hand the camera to the cameraman, and he does everything else, basically. You know, that's what documentary assistants do, which was perfect because I really didn't know that much about what I was doing. About what you knew at the time. Yeah. And essentially faking, faking it every inch of the way, but everybody else there, uh, everybody knew my position and didn't really care. And, I was just and you were a being time. paid a, you know, yeah. a lot less than some of the Maybe yeah, of course, right. much better qualified. So, so they thought it was a good deal. Yeah. But we were making movies, and you know, it was great. So uh, stayed there. Uh, eventually became uh, a 35 millimeter assistant there. Uh, was introduced to uh, a camera assistant named David Dalzell, mm -hmm. who really trained me to be uh, an assistant camera. Trained me how to be a second assistant, because we did a movie of the week there. At that, David Wolper had sold his company to Venture Media. Venture Media got into doing some TV movies uh, because I was associated with the company. I was actually fortunate enough to get into 659. When it was just as, uh, it was at a time when it was almost impossible to get into Union, just purely by accident because I was associated with this company. How did that happen? Yeah. Well, well because they signed a contract? Yeah. And exactly. you were there. You were grandfathered in. Right. And they did a TV movie. I got, I did. I worked on the second unit as an assistant cameraman that got 30 days in and basically got into the union before I got out of college. And, uh, oh, so all this was happening while you were still going to school? Yeah, I was still in school. Oh, all right. So because I was so close to finishing school that I just wanted to basically go through the formality, knowing that <clears throat> a degree in political science really was completely irrelevant to what I was going to be doing. But it was just the idea that I put all this energy into it. I actually liked school, and I just liked the whole process. So, Finished school, and uh, it's about the time that I got out of school, I was into the union. But this is at a time when uh, the uh, group system, the seniority system, was still in existence. So you come in as a group three. Uh, there wasn't uh, necessarily a lot of work in the business at the time. So I was in the union, but it was impossible to get a job. Oh, no. Because uh, I was a group three. And it was also a minority program in existence at the time. So even if, uh, uh, so the likelihood of a group three second assistant cameraman actually getting employment on a union job was completely out of the question. Get, getting less and less probable at the time. Right. And quite frankly, the union leadership at the time was uh, a different union leadership, and it was a whole different philosophy at the union. And uh, I'm happy to say that it's, a brand new philosophy under George D.B. and, and uh, Bruce Doring, the guys who are there now. But at the time, it was very, very difficult to get work 
even if you were in the union because of the seniority system, which was what the system was. So I basically worked at nine union mm -hmm. for several years because uh, I was attempting. Yeah, exactly. So I worked non union, did a lot of commercials, just worked as a, a, an assistant, anything actually. And those were the days when uh, there was a lot of non union uh, work around that was so low budget that anybody who had ever had any experience with a camera could basically get a job as a DP. So I, sometimes I would work as a DP, sometimes as a second assistant. I worked as a, a boom man on some low budget features. You know, well, who, was, who were the people you would work for at that time, if you can remember any of the, the folks? Uh, people but who are no longer in the business, a uh, uh, guy named Lee Frost, mm -hmm. uh, very, very small companies. And uh, was one, it was one, there was a company called AIP, which is American International Pictures, which mm -hmm. made low-budget bike, bi biker movies at the time. And I worked on a couple of those, and there was one job actually that was coming up. I needed, a, I needed some work. Everybody, they had the camera department was completely filled up, but there was one job open on the picture, which was Boom Man. And I'm, you know, I'd never had any experience in sound, but it was a job and I was available. So I went to work the first day and I met the sound mixer, who was a guy named Mike Fenton. And Mike Fenton is Mike Fenton, the casting agent, mm. who is a very successful and, and uh, very respected casting agent here in town now. And so Mike was the mixer because he was also at a job in the same circumstances. And he had more experience with sound than I did, but not a lot. So he had taken the job figuring that the boom man they hired would really be able to help him <laughs> figure out how to do the sound. And I showed up at work as the boom man knowing that all I had to do was talk to the mixer and we could kind of sort it out. And uh, it was real kind of embarrassed. <laughs> but the movie was so bad it didn't really matter anyway because uh, Nobody really wanted to hear any of the dialogue that was going on in this picture, so we just had a great time and had a lot of laughs. And fortunately, that was my last job in the sound department. Uh, so, kind of like plotted along for a couple of years, and then uh, David Dalzell, uh, who was a, had a brother named Dennis, and uh, his father was Archie Dalzell, who was a very well-known and respected uh, director of photography. Archie was shooting uh, episodic television for Aaron Spelling, and he was shooting The Rookies. And they had, uh, they needed a second assistant for one season on The Rookies. So I was recommended to uh, both Archie and Dennis by David. So I wound up doing a, a season on The Rookies as a second assistant camera. Great break. Yeah, it's a great break, and it's exactly what I wanted to do. I really wanted to get involved in basically uh, the studio system because I hadn't had much exposure to the studio system I, uh, and I knew that uh, because of where I wanted to go it was just a necessary step so I went to work for a season on the rookies a second and uh, <coughs> it was funny because it was at Fox and this is when Fox still had a loading room on the studio uh, at the studio so as for a second assistant on an episodic show where there's a loading room at the studio, there's really not a lot to do. I mean, you know, you, you do all the normal stuff, and do rehearsals and get marks, but I had a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. So I'd hang out with Archie, and Archie was a great guy, a wonderful guy who had a long career in the business, worked a long time as a camera operator. He did features with uh, Cecil B. DeMille, and I used to spend enormous amounts of time just talking to Archie. And basically, he, he would tell me war stories, but he would just... In the process, I just really got a sense of uh, the craft of a director of photography. Not from a real technical point of view. It's not, not necessarily about light or lenses or any of that stuff. It's just basically uh, just the role of the director of photography is almost like in, in, in his position in, in, in relationship to the director and the crew and just, just basically how a director of photography functions on the set. As a crew chief? It was a crew chief. I mean, just the whole system, and, and primarily in the, in the studio system and the Hollywood system, is, which is what I really had an exposure to. So it was really invaluable, uh, just from a, a procedural uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and he certain, Archie certainly had his style, and, and it made sense for, for the time, his photographic style, but it wasn't necessarily something that... that uh, 
was naturally, it wasn't a natural type of photographic style for me, but it really benefited from working with him, and he was just a great guy. But you learned what he did. I mean, you yeah, saw exactly. where, where you right. placed the key, and you were paying attention is what I'm saying, as right. opposed to just right. looking at your... Uh, yeah, so it was reports. a real, I mean, it was a, a great opportunity for a learning experience, which is the way I approached it, because I wasn't particularly interested in, uh, you know, the job. You know, it was basically an episodic show. It wasn't particularly good, and, but it was, uh, it was a great place to learn something about mm -hmm. cinematography. So I did that for a year, and then I went out and uh, started getting work as the first assistant at commercials. By, by this time, you'd gone through the roster system. You were, was this a couple years down the line <coughs> when you first got in? Yeah, this was a couple years, and I think what happened right in the process, I think that that's The roster system stayed in existence, but, but there, were, there were a lot of losses and challenges of the roster system where they kept advancing people who were in the union. They would all of a sudden promote everybody who was into a group one and then start the roster system all over again. So then anybody who came in after a certain day would become a group three. So it was just a very, it was a real mess, basically. You know? But uh, what was important is I uh, was able to work, which is basically all I cared about. You know? sure. And it was, just, it, was, it was at a time when there were a lot of legal challenges to the roster system. And uh, as a way of avoiding lawsuits, the union would just promote everybody who was in the union to a group one, and then they would start all over again, and then a whole new set of lawsuits would start. And, you know, it was all that kind of stuff. But uh, what was really important is that I just had the opportunity to go find work. So I, would, I started doing commercials as an assistant. And uh, I've always been involved in commercials, and I think they are... Uh, a great place for cinematography. There is some wonderful cin uh, cinematography that comes out of commercials. And I think it, it also is a great place to learn. And uh, you have access to uh, job opportunities there. Uh, access to work comes a lot easier. And in addition, I think that some of the best cinematography that's, that's around has come out of the, the, the commercial field. Some of the best cinematography is out of commercials. It's an opportunity to try. Uh, interesting cinematography, and uh, I've always been involved in it. So as an assistant cameraman, I, I, I met a couple of different director cameramen in commercials who were uh, still photographers out of New York, who, uh, when they would come out here, I would, one way or the other, I got in contact with them, and I developed a working relationship with some of these guys who were really doing some interesting work. Yeah, the, the commercials those days was like anything you throw on the wall, see if it sticks. They try everything. Isn't yeah, which is which is great. I yeah, mean, I think it's it's you know, half the fun of our job is being able to experiment that way. Mm -hmm. So uh, did that for a while. Got involved. There was a, a, a director named Melvin Sikolsky. It was Ben Sikolsky's father, and I worked with Melvin for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And a guy named Steve Horn. And uh, I was Steve Horn's first assistant. Right. So, and, and these were guys who were like really good still photographers who got involved in commercials in the 70s. And uh, their, their interest is photography. And uh, so I saw that as uh, we, we, we certainly had something in common because that was my primary interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has always been my approach to this job is to try to uh, be involved with people who are doing the most interesting visual work. And uh, that has always been my philosophy. And uh, rather than get involved in certain personalities or the idea of working on big shows, I've always tried to be involved with people who are doing interesting photography. And uh, something that I can interpret as, as quality work. You know, whatever the level, whether it's documentaries or commercials or uh, television, or features, uh, my primary em emphasis has always been quality visual work. So I saw the commercials as just a way to do that. And it, was, you know, it wasn't like I was trying to, OK, I'm going to go do commercials now, and then I'm going to go do features, or whatever it is. I just I found myself just in association with these guys. They were doing good work, and so that's where I stayed. And uh, worked as an assistant, as a first assistant. And got an opportunity to do a TV movie at Paramount with a guy named Jules Brenner. He was doing a TV movie, it was like 1975. 
and uh, did this TV movie, met Dick Barlow, mm -hmm. who was at the camera department. He was running the camera, camera department at Paramount then. Did this TV movie, and it was kind of like an involved TV movie, and we had three or four cameras, and it was kind of complicated, and so it all came out pretty well, and so I got to be friends with Dick. And uh, he had never heard of me as an assistant, and he was always looking for new, basically new people to work on his crews. So he offered to put me on one of their series, and I really wasn't interested in it because I'd just come off the rookies, and I really wasn't interested in doing another, uh, uh, any more episodic. I told him that it was great, I appreciated the offer, but I wanted to try doing features, and he thought, well, that's going to be very difficult because I didn't have any feature experience as an assistant. So off we went. And I didn't hear anything from him for a while, and I got a call from him one day that he had a feature that they were looking for a first assistant to do, and would I be interested in doing it? And it was with this cameraman named Dick Klein, who I didn't know Dick. And uh, so I said, yeah, great. So I was kind of curious why Dick was having a problem getting a first, and I didn't really know why because I knew who he was. And I thought it would be pretty easy for Dick to get a first assistant, but I went for an interview with him. We got along great. And so they offered me the job. And I discovered later on, as I'm prepping to Panavision, that uh, the director's this guy named Michael Winter, you know, who, as it turns out, everybody who's ever worked with him just hates him. <laughs> <laughs> because he's truly, he's probably the, uh, he is the only person that I've ever met that I think I can truly call a, a real sadist. I mean, this is a guy who really loves to see other people in pain. So the word was out of Michael Winter, and there, is a, there wasn't an assistant in town who wanted to do this job. And of course, I kind of stumbled into it thinking, oh, what a great break. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I'm learning this at Panavision. You know, as I'm prepping, everybody's coming by and they say, what are you doing? I'm, well, I'm doing this job with Dick Klein and Michael Winter. And they say, uh, it's too bad. <laughs> so, so, Raise uh, your confidence level tremendously. <laughs> well, I figure I have nothing to lose. Nobody knows me anyway. Yeah. So, uh, so we start the job, and uh, for some reason I got along with Michael Winter. I still don't know why. Yeah. But uh, we had a lot of problems. Michael Winter, I mean, he's basically not a nice guy, and he's proud of it. I mean, he's, you know, he, he's, he's the first one to admit it. I mean, that's his style. You know, he, he basically is a prick, and he knows it, and he loves it. You know? <laughs> and uh, he kept firing camera operators for no reason. You know? So it was my first, so here's, this is the, you know, what I consider to be my break as a feature assistant. And uh, it's also my first experience with uh, the sort of syndrome, you know, let's fire somebody syndrome, you know, that syndrome. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, it was the camera operators. So John Flynn was the first camera operator. So Michael, Win Michael Winter fired him after two weeks because, you know, he, he was too tall or something. You know? I mean, you know, <laughs> something, you know, I'm really stupid. And, uh, which was probably great for John. I think he moved up right after that. It was probably the best thing that could have happened. You know? and, and then we had this whole series of camera operators. I think John was the only one who actually got fired. But then, so Dick Klein could see what was coming. So he would get the best camera operators he could possibly get because he knew him. Uh, he needed it for Michael Winter, you know, uh, just, just to deal with Michael. So Tommy Lockridge was the second operator. And uh, what would happen is all these guys would come in. So Tommy took the job and then immediately looked for another job and because he knew he didn't want to be there for you know, 10 more or 12 more weeks. And so he was there for about three, wound up on a better picture, went to work for Fred Cohen Camp on something. So he bailed out and Bill Johnson was the next operator. And so Bill came in and, you know, and, he, and all these guys were great. They could really deal with winter and they were great operators. And I'm just the new kid, you know, basically, okay, this is a revolving door of all these operators. So it was, Lockridge and Bill Johnson came in and he got a better job. He went off with Phil Lathrop somewhere and, and then Bill Clark came in, you know. And uh, so Bill was there and blah, 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 and he figured it out and he got another job working with uh, uh, Frank Stanley. Frank Stanley yeah. And then Ronnie Vargas was there. And so finally by that time, you know, we were getting so close to the end and Ronnie didn't have anything else to do with it. He decided he was going to stay. But what, what happened for me, the greatest thing for me is, 
I got the opportunity to work with all these guys, all these wonderful yeah. operators. All at the same time, just one yeah. after another, see what their style was. Right. In, in really uh, trying circumstances, really difficult cir political circumstances because of uh, the director. And uh, it was great. I mean, it was uh, you know, just the greatest introduction to uh, the world of feature filmmaking. And uh, so the fact that I survived that kind of impressed uh, Dick Barlow. You know, he didn't believe I was going to make it. And of course, this was all in everybody's mind going in. It's kind of like, well, we'll see what happens. You know, it's kind of like it was the sort of the. You would be in the revolving door too. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of like the Roman Colosseum approach to filmmaking. You know, it's kind of like you get Christians, you get lines, you throw them all in the center, and somebody walks out at the end of the day. You know, so I made it through the whole picture. So then. Uh, he recommends me to John Alonzo, who was preparing Black Sunday. And they needed a B-camera assistant. So uh, I met John and wound up doing Black Sunday on the B-camera. Ray Mewell was, was the A-camera assistant, I was the B-camera assistant. So which was a big picture, John Frank and I were, you know, huge picture. So I did that. Then I, so I just got involved in features and stayed with John. Is this taking too long? This no, this is, is great. This is You've having a great time with that. So, uh, started working with John. And I had never met John before, of course I knew who John was. And he had been nominated for Chinatown and you know, his when he was doing some great work. And uh, he also had a history of Wolper. So we sort of had this common background and I kind of understood where John was coming from. You know, he was really a mix of, you know, small filmmaking and big features. Mm -hmm. Because this is really what he was doing. Uh, some of his biggest uh, feature work. So I did Black Sunday. And I kind of understood John's style, you know, only because, of, you know, John has this mix of documentary and, and uh, feature style. He's always trying to incorporate documentary techniques into his feature filmmaking, and, you know, and very well in my head. So, um, got along with John really well. And John is, uh, uh, in addition to uh, Wanting to operate, you know, he just has, he just has a natural tendency to want to pick up the camera and operate, which I understood kind of having been involved in documentaries, having shot documentaries like John, I just understood that basically that was his basic approach and we just got along. And he would, the uh, great thing about John, he's always looking to give people an opportunity to move up. You know, he's always, He's always letting his, his assistants do guest shots for the operator. He's always sending the operators out to do uh, 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 second unit work. So when I was an assistant, John would periodically on the Black Sunday, we had multiple cameras, and I would wind up on a camera as, as an operator, even though I was still an assistant. And uh, John recognized that I had uh, the ability to be an operator. And this is something that I've always recognized. I've always felt comfortable operating. It's, it's just something that I've never felt awkward operating motion picture cameras. For some reason, I've always uh, found it not difficult to pick up a camera and make pictures. It's make just, a graceful it's shot. To it's just you know, and it's not really. really it's not ego. It's not you know. It's not bragging. It's just something that I just had a natural inclination for. That's part of the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing. It's just, it always felt good to pick up a camera and operate it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was able to, with John, basically demonstrate that I had the ability to be an operator. And uh, worked with him through several pictures. And uh, while we were working together, he promoted Ray to, uh, from first assistant to operator. John was always big for promoting people, you know, and uh, which, to his credit, I, I think it was wonderful that he did. I'm very thankful to him. But uh, Chewy Elizondo was uh, working, and Chris Schreiber were working with us on Black Sunday. And after Black Sunday, he promoted Ray Villalobos to be operator, and Ray was his operator for a couple of pictures. And while, and then I became his A camera assistant. So while we were doing this, we were doing a movie called Cheap Detective at uh, Columbia. And uh, Ray was the operator. I was the first assistant. Horace Jordan was my second. And uh, while we were doing this, the picture was 
a very long picture that took place on stage. And uh, periodically, John would get bored, and he'd tell Ray that Ray was, he would we'd have career day. Everybody would move up. Ray would light, I would operate, Horace would be the first assistant. Great. And John would kind of sit back and, you know, not say much until we sort of floundered, and then he'd jump in and save everybody, <laughs> which is also something John likes to do. John likes to save everybody a lot. So, but it was great fun, and Ray got the light, and I got to operate, and Horace got to be the focus for it. Great. And uh, so after that, he told me that I was going to be the operator on his next picture, whatever that happened to be. And this was at a time when he was really busy. I mean, we were going from picture to picture. We would literally have two or three weeks off and uh, go back to work. So I thought, I thought that sounded great. You know, I was ready to be an operator. And uh, as it turned out, John's next picture was the picture he directed, you know. So, uh, which he didn't know at the time when he made me the offer. So. When I found out that he was going to direct this picture, this next picture, and not shoot it, I offered to uh, basically postpone moving up because I figured as a director he was going to need uh, the best crew we could have. He wouldn't really want to have to deal with uh, a first time anything as a director because it's his first time as a director. He should be concentrating on directing and not have to worry about the camera crew sort of trying to figure out their jobs as they went along. Mm -hmm. So I offered to. Uh, postponed moving up, so did, so did Horace. But John decided that no, he made the offer and he wanted to uh, uh, back up his offer and he insisted that we move up. And uh, because he was directing, he needed a DP, so he hired a guy named David Myers as his DP. And David was a, a friend of his, David's a, a cinematographer that lives in San Francisco, has done both features, television, documentaries, and uh, just this great guy. And he hired David to be the DP. And told David that, because David was asking about a crew and he didn't have a, necessarily have a permanent crew, and John said, well, you can use my crew. That's what he told David. And uh, There you go. But he didn't tell him that we were moving up and that I was going to be a first time operator. His focus probably was going to be first time. And uh, so David just assumed that we were getting, he was getting the regular crew, but guys who had done this before. So uh, about a week before we started shooting, David discovered that uh, what the circumstances were, and uh, kind of freaked out a little bit, but relaxed, and we started work, and had a couple of rough days, and Horace and I would just basically make it happen, figure it out, talked a lot, got it done, and we moved on. So you made a movie, made it stick. Yeah, made it made it stick, and but I still, I mean, I I have to give John a lot of credit for. Uh, basically uh, living up to his, what he saw as his commitments. And once he made the offer, in his mind, uh, it was a done deal. Even though it was his first job as a director, uh, he essentially uh, was going to back up his offer and, and to his credit. Way cool. I like that. Right. So, stay with John. And then John went back to shooting. The next picture he did was uh, Farmer Ray, which was my second feature as an operator, mm -hmm. and which we shot in this textile factory in Alabama, mostly handheld and with two cameras all the time, John operating one and me operating one and basically chasing Sally Fuel around this textile factory with uh, Marty Ritt as a director. And so then I get into this whole period of working uh, on some pretty good features as an operator with some good directors, which I saw really as absolutely invaluable. And uh, I started to really have a good time uh, uh, as a camera operator and in the work. I mean, it's, I still consider to be operating one of the best jobs on the set. Uh, I just, I got involved in doing some really good pictures with some really good directors and uh, began a long list of pictures as an operator where I really uh, felt that I had the opportunity to do some good work and was working with the kind of people that I wanted to be with. So I did that. I did work with John and Norma Ray. And the next year we did uh, Tom Horn, which was the Steve McQueen second to last picture mm -hmm. uh, western, which uh, I felt was uh, visually a really uh, a spectacular picture. It wasn't a very very good picture for a lot of different reasons, but uh, visually we had a great time with it. Got some really good experience shot 
second unit uh, on that picture. There was actually uh, no opening to the picture. Every, we started this movie, it was a bad script. The movie had no opening. About halfway through the picture, the producer came to John and asked him to come up with an idea for an opening to the picture. Wow. And uh, he came to, Ray was on the picture with him. Ray was actually working on it as an operator at B camera. And a friend of mine, Chuck Minsky, uh, was an assistant. Chuck actually, I should have mentioned Chuck before. Chuck was someone that I met way, way, way uh, back, right at the very beginning. And we were worked as assistants on uh, non-union stuff together. And we sort of had this parallel uh, uh, journey through, uh, uh, through our careers. We were always sort of working on different shows together as assistants, or we'd get work back and forth. So Chuck was on. Tom Horan as an assistant, like in the B camera. And we would hang out. So John came to us, I'm sort of digressing a bit, but John no, came not, to us. No, keep going. And he didn't really want to, you know, he figured, well, this is a great opportunity for somebody else to come up with an opening for this picture. So he came to us and said, see if you can come up with an idea. So Chuck and I wrote a scene uh, for the opening of the picture, uh, which involved uh, just Steve McQueen by himself sitting uh, at a campfire at dawn, at sunrise, and uh, which is great for the picture because it's the story of Tom Horn in the latter part of his life when he's sort of leaving one phase of his life, moving on to another phase, and the picture opens with him in this town, and he's come from some place, and yet in the script it gave you absolutely no indication of where, so it just needed a, uh, the picture really needed a sense of, of uh, this character. Mm -hmm. So we wrote this sequence, he's sitting at a campfire at dawn, just him and his horse, and uh, very contemplative. And uh, it worked, you know, we wound up shooting it uh, on the last day of the film at sunrise, and it was a beautiful, beautiful sequence. And, you know, it was, it, it was a wonderful opportunity for us because it was sort of like, well, we conceptualized the sequence, uh, we designed it, we laid it out, uh, and on the very last day of the picture, we shot it. And fortunately, it was a beautiful sunrise. We shot it with three cameras, and uh, it worked. We began the sequence, and yeah, and it worked. And, it, and we only had about a three-minute uh, window of time to do it, and basically, you know, it all fell into place. So it was great, and it was only because well, John I'm gave credited it. too. But you know, you didn't get a credit on that sucker. No, but I mean, I knew, and Chuck knew, and uh, John knew, and, it's, and essentially, it was just a, in in just in terms of a piece of education as director of photography or just the opportunity to, to uh, try out an idea it was wonderful because uh, it really was designing a sequence and organizing it and shooting it. Oh, that's great. What a fun thing to do. And, and, and unfortunately, Steve checked out soon after that, so there was that opportunity to... Yeah. Well, it, it wasn't even what it was going to get us as much as it was just you could see it on, on the screen. Yeah. It was. You know, yeah, it was, it was happening. It was working. And uh, so that was, you know, just, just, just a, uh, a, great, a great show. So you managed to get into the feature world and just stay there. You didn't, uh, and, and, and commercials too, but yeah. uh, you managed to get in there and get working and get to, up as an operator with Alonzo's crews. And you started getting a reputation and getting around with that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and all part of that is, I mean, no, that's exactly it. Once, once I started there, it was, you know, it's sort of like every every job generates its own next job. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the fact that John and I did get along, and uh, I was getting opportunities to do the kind of things that I wanted to do like that, we were good. And uh, right after Tom Horn, Ray Vilo was got an opportunity to move up to director of photography and do Urban Cowboy, mm -hmm. and because Ray and I had worked with John together, and we were really good friends. He asked me to be the operator. And uh, which I thought was great because it gave me an opportunity to get a, take a break from John, you know, it's sort of like, you know. Stretch your wings a little bit, yeah. go the direction, sure. Yes. And uh, so I did, uh, I was the operator, Chuck Minsky was the uh, assistant, mm -hmm. Ray was the DP, and, and this was great because uh, it was a good opportunity for all of us, and we really enjoyed working together, we really hung out together, so it was kind of like it was a whole different working relationship, you know, among the camera crew, it's really like, 
bunch of people who were in it. Sounds a wild movie. That was a really uh, made a lot of people's uh, reputations actors. And yeah, and it was Ray's first picture as a DP, mm -hmm. and he did a wonderful job. And it was, you know, it was very difficult, especially for uh, a first time DP. And we had a great time doing it. It was like one of the all time great film experiences in terms of a social event as well as uh, good work. We shot inside Gillies, inside this bar for 60 shooting days. That was just I hear the biggest bar location. in the world or something. Yeah, there. I mean, it's huge, huge. And, and Ray spent a couple weeks lighting it, and uh, we spent 60 days there, not consecutive, uh, shooting it, and spent four months in Houston. And this is the film that made David Winger's career, and Scott Glenn's career, and uh, Ray Lobos's career. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it was, it was uh, just a, a lot of fun and uh, a great opportunity. Wow, terrific shows to be working on. Uh, and all this time you're watching the light. You're, 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 this blends into your style still. Everyone's uh, pretty yeah. much a guerrilla shooter, uh, uh, on the move, move quickly, uh, sketchy, lighting, not, uh, not overlit. You know, those things all fit. Yeah, no, and Ray, was, yeah, Ray was doing an exceptionally good job lighting this picture. And, especially as a first time DP, it was very impressive. And, uh, yeah, and I'm watching learning, but uh, watching and learning lighting, but, but more important, really, really starting to work as an operator in terms of uh, working with the camera, working with directors, uh, because that's part of this process as an operator. And I would really get involved with the director of photography, in terms of laying out shots, and in the process, you, you, you obviously come in contact with the director, and you're uh, being asked for your opinion and your ideas, and so you, you, there was a lot of opportunity for input with, with John and Ray at this at this stage, and the directors we were working with were really good directors: Marty Ritt, uh, John Frankenheimer, mm -hmm. uh, Jim Bridges. So slowly moving into a position where I was just getting more and more experience and more comfortable and more knowledgeable about the camera, how to use the camera to tell the story, you know, all the things that basically cinematography is about. I was just acquiring more and more experience and uh, uh, expertise. Well, remember, since we're in the area of uh, camera operating, uh, what, what do you look for in, in framing? But what's your eye tell you to look for? What I mean, headroom sizes. Uh, I mean, do you do you, do you kind of divide up the the screen and try to to place your people in certain areas? Uh, I, mean, I don't have a formula. I mean, it really is. It's 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 all intuitive, and it's not really something that I make a a really uh, conscious decision. Mm -hmm. It's not pre-planned. I mean, it's just the aesthetic. You look through a frame. And you find that constantly searching for something that looks good. Something that draws your eye, uh, right. forms. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's when, when in, in, on a set, when we're laying out shots or laying out sequences, I'll put, uh, usually put a, a zoom lens on a finder and walk around and look for a shot. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not, you know, I mean, it may be something that's storyboard, it may be something, an idea that comes out of a storyboard. Uh, it may be pre-planned, it may not be, it may be completely spontaneous, but uh, it's all about looking through again, it's looking through a lens and finding something that makes sense in terms of an aesthetic or uh, a storytelling point. And I guess what it really is is a combination of those things. It's really, it's an interesting composition that tells the story. You know? mm -hmm. It's always in my mind, it's, it's, that's what I'm looking for. And uh, I'll keep looking through a lens until I find it. And maybe it's not about how much headroom a guy has or you know spatial relationships. I mean, it's all of those things. Mm -hmm. and, and nothing really takes priority other than uh, an interesting visual that tells a story. I mean, that is the priority. Because your movies all have got those frames that are nicely set out. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're draw lines drawing you to certain uh, things. There's a, uh, it's, it's always fun to watch your stuff. I mean, and uh, the, what I'm trying to get at as an operator, you try to develop this. Uh, well, I mean, that's, that's, and I think that's probably why I uh, was an operator for as long as I was. And because my, my emphasis has always been uh, 
I guess compositional as opposed to lighting. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I always see a story, when I read a script, I'm visualizing uh, spatial relationships as opposed to which direction the light is coming from. You know, I think that's my natural inclination. That's probably why I was an operator and that's why I've always felt comfortable like looking through lenses and uh, I've always felt a natural inclination to do that. And that's maybe why I wound up in documentaries because it's, it's sort of like the, uh, the and the uh, I have difficulty expressing this, but uh, believe me, um, composition is one of the most difficult things to verbalize. It's a visual thing. It's a it's a visual shorthand, and, and, and to try and get out because you do this so well, and trying to get a little bit of it out of you that uh, uh, what what kind of process you go through when you bring things up. It's not a it's process as much as just. Uh, following your intuition mm -hmm. and uh, just having a natural uh, sense of it. And, uh, you know, the idea of light, of course, comes into it and, and, and the way light affects it, you know, it's like this painting on the wall. I mean, it's a combination of great composition and uh, uh, a wonderful sense of light, you know, mm -hmm. that gives you mood and a sense of place and all of that. But I think for me, it always starts with composition. and. Uh, and light is a, certainly a natural extension of that. Mm -hmm. But and I think some people start with a sense of light and uh, uh, it's work backwards. Mm -hmm. For me, it's always kind of like I need a frame. You know, and I always uh, think of uh, uh, the story in terms of the frame, mm -hmm. and it's always it's just always been there in my head. That's the way. That's where it starts. No, I see where it comes from, from your still photography and from your, your uh, documentary. I mean, you know, it's always training that eye, making... Yeah, but I'm not sure which came for. first. I'm not sure I wound up in still photography or the documentaries because somehow I needed to have the frame or, uh, the, uh, you know, the still photography mm -hmm. or the documentary gave me a sense of the frame. You know, and I think I've sort of drawn into those areas in the photography because, you know, I've always seen the frame, and that's probably from sitting in the front row of the theater when I was eight years old, you know, kind of like surrounded by this huge screen. Well, know? also having the lens in your hand. And yeah. I think that that kind of focuses it, right. so to speak, or, or, or centers it on something, an right. object. This is the thing that brings it in. Is that a fair statement? I, mean, that I don't know. It just always, it always feels good to have that device in your hand. It always, you know, I just always had a natural inclination to pick up the camera and use it, you know, yeah. and uh, still do. Well, uh, this is, while we're on the subject, uh, once you find a kind of a, a style uh, that's working for a show, then do you kind of amplify, come back to that same, you know, way in the frame, one direction? Do you try to match that and duplicate that? And try within to, within the project, the, the same, yeah, the same project. Do you try to? Uh, is that how the system works for you? It, uh, it's not quite that uh, uh, well organized. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it is. I mean, it's not. Uh, I mean, on legends. Legends was uh, Legends of the Fall. This picture I just got the Academy Award for. It, was a, a story that came out of a book by Jim Harrison, a novella. It's a three uh, three story novella. Uh, one of the stories was called Legends of the Fall. The book's called Legends of the Fall, which I had read <coughs> several years ago, which I thought was a great book, wonderful book, wonderful story. Jim Harrison is a wonderful writer, and this is a story that was so uh, descriptive. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a wonderful writer who uh, describes his settings wonderful. All of his books are visual stories. Mm -hmm. They are set in, 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 in and he's so sensitive to uh, settings and just the environments and his uh, descriptions of the environments are unbelievably visual. And this particular story was uh, especially that way. And when I read the story, it was so obvious to me that of uh, the way this story should look if it was ever turned into a film. And especially because the setting in Montana in a ranch setting and, and just, uh, I've spent a lot of time in New Mexico and in Colorado and a little bit in Montana and I knew exactly what this story should look like uh, based on my experiences and, and uh, just the natural beauty uh, that exists in that type of setting, you know, basically in the Rocky Mountains. And 
So I knew what this movie should look like if it was ever made. Reading the novel. Oh yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's just long ago script is what I'm saying. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, because it's, number one, it's written that way, and ever having spent any time in that kind of an environment, you understand exactly what he's writing about and what he's feeling and, and what, what what he's talking about, what he's setting his characters in those in that particular environment. So I knew that if this picture ever got made as a film, or if the story ever got made as a film, that it would be something that I would love to do, and I knew exactly what it should look like in my mind. And so I got a call from a guy named Pat Crowley. And I'm jumping way ahead here. Go right ahead. So Pat, Pat Crowley is the executive producer, line producer on this uh, picture. And he was a, a guy who I'd worked with three other times when he was a first AD. He, he was the first AD on uh, Falcon the Snowman, a picture I did with Alan Davio. And uh, on Sweet Dreams, picture I did with Robbie Greenberg and a picture called Just Between Friends, a picture I did with uh, Jordan Cronenworth. Mm -hmm. I was the operator on all these pictures and uh, they were the directors of photography. And Pat had been the first AD. And then just coincidentally, these pictures were done uh, consecutively. You know, just for three pictures in a row, I'd worked with the same AD. And so we had gotten, we'd gotten to be friends and we really had a mutual respect for one another's uh, professional ability. And so uh, there was a gap of several years between uh, those pictures and the, and the time he was doing Legends, but they were looking for a director of photography. And the director was Ed Zwick. He uh, didn't have a director of photography that he was familiar with or comfortable with, and so they were interviewing a lot of people and I went in for an interview. And uh, got along with Ed. We had a very similar point of view about uh, the approach to the picture. And uh, he liked the same types of pictures that I did. He was using some of the same types of pictures that I was using as, uh, as references for uh, exterior types of photography, and we just got along. And, and you read the book? Yeah, and I, and I was- You read the material? Yeah, I was very familiar with the, with the book and the story, liked the story, really wanted to do the right. picture, and basically got the job. You know, Excellent. And, and proceeded to shoot the movie exactly, not exactly, but uh, the way that I had seen it when I first read it. And it was just, I mean, it was just, uh, it screamed for that kind of approach. I mean, it was, it was really what the picture really needed. And, uh, so did you visualize the scene? Did you, did the, the script pretty much follow the, the book and the, uh, and, and the description no, of where it was going? Well, uh, the weirdest thing about it is the, uh, the script completely turned the book around. You know, and the, the, the book is a wonderful, uh, uh, essentially, it's a romantic adventure story. Emphasis, emphasis on adventure. Mm -hmm. That is, that's the book. The script is a romantic uh, adventure story. Emphasis on romantic. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, the uh, the book was a great guy story. You know, this is a, and Jim Harrison is a great guy, and uh, men really love Jim Harrison and his books and. It's a, you know, it's kind of like a grown-up boy's adventure story is what, you know, Legends of the Fall is, you know, and uh, the book, you know, and it's a great guy's story, and the script was a girl's story, you know, and that's, that's basically the emphasis, and that's, you know, women are going to see Legends of the Fall, you know, in, in greater, much greater proportions than men, you know, right. and, oh, and uh, so it became a romance, the movie and the book was uh, adventure. Uh, but that's okay, the photographic approach didn't change. <laughs> I was still doing my version of uh, Jim Harris. Well, but obviously it was of course, you found an audience. I mean, they can't complain about success. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, it was, but they, they were completely interchangeable, and that's in, visually, that's also the, uh, the visual interpretation that direct, the director, Ed Swick, wanted to give it. So we weren't really working against one another. We were completely in collaboration. And, and in wonderful collaboration, I might add. I mean, we, it was, we did have a really good working relationship. And, uh, but anyway, I mean, that's, that, that is the genesis of the, uh, the photographic style. And once we were into it, I mean, I knew what I wanted to do uh, compositionally with uh, the, the, the settings, because that location was as good a location, I think, as you can 
possibly ask for mm -hmm. for exterior shooting. Yep, someone outside there. A little tapping on your door, maybe some repair work. Hold on, let's, uh, let's stop taking And we're back. Hi, yeah. John. Yeah. That was uh, someone at the door trying to get a donation. For yes, someone. right. And uh, so where were we? Oh, we were still with Legends of the Fall. Right. We were talking about uh, the visual visuals of that, how it was, uh, yeah, you had read, read the book and that uh, you you loved the visuals that you read and that right. you brought them to the screen because of that uh, well, vision. Yeah, and Legends, I mean, Legends truly was a wonderful opportunity for me. And uh, as it turned out, that was an unbelievable opportunity. And, uh, but I consider myself to be very fortunate having had that opportunity because it was a picture that I felt I really, number one, wanted to do, and number two, really knew how to shoot, and knew what the potential for the picture was, knew what it should look like, knew how to do it, and uh, shooting it physically was really demanding, and it was never easy, and you know it was tough, all those things, but from one perspective, it was easy because I really knew what the movie should look like. Yeah. And I knew how to tell that story. And I knew what I wanted to do in terms, you know, in the broad in the broad scope. I really knew what it wanted to look like. And I knew how to make it look that way. So it just became uh, basically a question of uh, doing it. And doing it is never easy, but doing it when you know what you want to do and which direction to go in is a lot easier than trying to figure that out uh, when you just don't have a feeling for a particular project. Okay, well let's go into your bag of tricks for this show. Just to uh, pull out, see what rabbits you pulled out of that hat. Um, did you uh, use uh, diffusion, a, f a lens filtration? Well, like, uh, yeah, I did, but just in terms of like, you know, like the big picture. Yeah, sort of. Uh, what, what, what that picture really what we really wanted was to uh, feel as natural and unmanipulated as possible. Okay. And that was just, that's just the nature of that story. That's what I always saw in it. And uh, in a funny kind of way, uh, the schedule sort of like uh, lent itself to that particular photographic style because at times we were shooting available light, which uh, I didn't do because we could go fast. I did because that's photographically, that's what the picture wanted. They mm -hmm. don't, stylistically, that's what worked best for that picture. And just coincidentally, it, it worked well in terms of us being able to accomplish a lot of work in a relatively short period of time. Okay, so in plotting out your plan for doing the picture, then you would go to the locations and scout them at the time of day that you might shoot <coughs> them and say this is the yeah, light here? I spent a lot of time on, uh, in prep on my own time. Mm -hmm. As soon as I knew I was going to do the picture, I immediately went to Canada. We shot in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, I had officially four weeks of prep time on the picture as you know, getting paid, but went up about three or four weeks ahead of that, just on my own, because I knew uh, from all my exterior shooting experience, I knew that the most more time I could spend on location uh, just uh, organizing in my own head uh, where to shoot, what time of day to shoot it. Uh, if the more I knew about that ahead of time, uh, the more I could uh, convince the director how to approach a particular sequence, which yeah. is exactly what happened. So I went up there and uh, everybody was up there, everybody was in preparation, we were still casting, Ed Zwick, the director, was there. And we spent a lot of time together and when he was busy doing all the thousands of other things that directors do besides talk about photography. Uh, I go to the location, we knew where the location was, the ranch was being built. Uh, there was an enormous amount of the story that took place at this one location, which was a fantastic location. And I just spent a lot of time sitting there watching the light and uh, thinking about how we could play individual sequences, where we could play them. And not really making hard decisions, but just in my own head, organizing what the possibilities were. Well, the great God Gaffer has given you a certain amount of light that you got to deal with one way or the other. And we were actually the uh, even positioning the buildings for the ranch. The they were all planned and but not actually completely positioned. So I would go 
and spend some time with one of the art directors with models, and we would kind of move models around. And we would put the barn here in relationship to the ranch house and point it in that direction, and I'd kind of watch what would happen with the light and just anticipate what would happen with the light. And then we'd change it around and reverse it and turn the barn in the other direction. Of course, I want the bottles, you know, because we had actually physically uh, started the construction. But really, in my head, um, figured out what would give me the most opportunities and the most flexibility and look the best. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time doing that. And then um, later on in the, in the, the uh, pre-production schedule, Ed and I, Ed's work, the director, uh, went through the entire script, scene by scene. And uh, he, he does this all the time with the storyboard artist by himself. And he does it, not that he uses the storyboards as uh, a real guy, because you know these are basically dialogue scenes we're talking about, the storyboards are relatively meaningless. But he does it as a way of organizing in his head what's important about the sequence, and figuring out in his mind what he needs in terms of uh, how all the sequences relate to the other sequences in the picture, and, uh, you know, props and, and, and all the other facets of, of, of filmmaking. It's not just, you know, where to put the camera when you get to the set. So this is a process that he goes through. So I sat in with him during this. We talked about each individual sequence in terms of uh, how it's important to the story, what it meant to the story, what the visual opportunities for a sequence were, and of course, from my perspective, well, how I could not uh, photograph, how to not only photograph it, but use it as an opportunity to tell the story in the most interesting visual way possible. And, 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 and you know, and that's what I see as my role is to be the uh, 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 basically the proponent of the visual content of the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am the the visual advocate. I'm there to basically defend the interest of the. Uh, the visual aspects of the film, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in an ideal way, uh, way or uh, in my mind, I want to work with people who also have that visual emphasis. And, and it's kind of like if I'm not, it's like I don't want to have to argue too hard for the visual. I really don't even want to be involved in a project where you have to argue for the visuals. You know, try and talk people into uh, uh, being interested no, in photography. Right. I mean, I'm just not interested in being there. And, and Ed, of course, is a very visual director, so uh, it was great because, well, we could, we could spend a lot of time talking about how to tell this story. That's what you tell it, yeah. Right. And the fact that we had this opportunity to, to sit there and go through this, the script like this, it took us about a week off and on. We, of course, they couldn't do it continuously, but I mm -hmm. uh, spent a lot of time doing it. So by the time we were through with it, we had... Uh, we were at least in agreement that uh, we were going to try and take advantage of all the natural characteristics of the, land, of the location as much as possible, shoot particular sequences at a certain time of day in a certain direction because that's when the light was best and that's what the light that lent itself to uh, uh, that sequence, that sequence yeah. and basically in the overall approach to the film in terms of the big picture for the story. And uh, that's what we did basically. So uh, you, uh, if I could develop that a little further, um, so you would take a, a morning sequence and, and over a period of like three or four days, uh, come back to the same set and. and, and no, we only did that. Uh, we only did that once. What it would what what we would do is, um, I would figure out what was going to work best for the biggest shots. You know, we would organize a sequence around the big shots, and the coverage would essentially come out of. You know, it's a natural uh, extension of what the masters were. But I would design uh, the big shots around time of day. Mm -hmm. And then the coverage, we would just manipulate the light and coverage to match whatever it was we had established for the wide shots. Mm -hmm. And But we never really got into the, uh, okay, we'll shoot whatever we can today and then come back tomorrow because uh, what really complicated the whole the whole plan. I mean, it was a great plan, but it was uh, uh, constantly uh, shifting because of the weather, which mm -hmm. was really bad. And this was the summer of '93, where we had all the flooding in the Midwest, we had an enormous amount of rain. So we had all like great intentions, 
but the weather became a real factor. Mm -hmm. So in addition to trying to shoot time of day, the light didn't cooperate more than half the time. So sometimes we wouldn't even shoot sequences that were on the call sheet and that we had planned on shooting because we get the location, it would be like awful weather, or we'd be into the, uh, uh, we'd start a sequence and you could actually see storms coming over well, those big sky country where you can see things almost coming over the horizon yeah. at you. And the weather would change that fast and, you know, literally within 15 minutes we could go from being in brilliant sunshine with very little cloud cover to lightning storms. Mm. And so we were constantly having to adjust to bad weather. So, you know, when, when the weather was good and uh, uh, weather cooperated, we would just proceed with the plan and hope for the best. But uh, more than half the time, we would just completely forget the plan and just have to adapt to it. All right, so what happens when you do that? And when you adapt, do you go for a cover set? Yeah, and then and the greatest thing about this whole scenario is that the production designer, Lily Kilbert, built the ranch to be practical so we could shoot cover at location. Mm -hmm. So the bottom floor of the ranch was practical. The kitchen and the living room and the for dining all your room. interiors, yes. Uh, most of the interiors, we could just, we, if we were at the ranch and there was an enormous amount of shooting that took place at this location, we would just jump inside the set and shoot another sequence, which made the actors crazy. And, uh, but for the most part, they were very cool with it because they come in and were prepared to shoot one scene and then all of a sudden discover that the weather had forced us into something else. So we would do that periodically, but what it did is it allowed us to stay on schedule. And, uh, I mean, everybody had to compromise, you know, I would compromise some of the light because we had, you know, designed to be shooting a certain way and we might be shooting brilliant, you know, an interior that was theoretically brilliant sunlight outside and we'd be in the middle of this incredible lightning storm. And uh, <laughs> so... With your HMI's outside pumping light into... Yeah, which is what, I mean, you know, that's what you do all the time, but, you know, just when, when you have really, you're shooting a practical interior and you've got really bad weather outside and you're trying to light from the outside, it just really complicates your life. Sure. We had to stop shooting inside sometimes because there was so much lightning outside oh. that nobody could move. You know? oh. And, uh, but having that set on location really allowed us to jump in and out of the house quite a bit. And the longer we stay there, the better we got at it because everybody became accustomed to that sort of style. So it was kind of like, you know, stay light on your feet, show up for work, planning to shoot the call sheet, be prepared to change uh, very quickly, and that's what we did a lot. Mm -hmm. We just had uh, we just had the right people there that allowed us to do that. We had a great production crew, a great AD, Neil Otero, Pat Crowley was the producer, very supportive. Lily Kilworth, the production designer, was unbelievably talented and and uh, supportive and. Had it was, it was a large part of this whole visual design. So it was like, I was just incredibly fortunate to have this group of people in this picture, and that's part of the reason that it looks as good as it did, just because, not to mention Ed Swick, who was, was, was basically, uh, uh, once he got comfortable with the idea of what we're doing, and once we started shooting, and the picture started looking good, was unbelievably supportive. You know? and, I, and it's impossible to do this without a director. Cameraman just can't do it by themselves. I mean, you just can't, basically, you just can't manipulate everybody. There, there was a time, I think, when that did happen, but I think that's history, you know. Those days are gone. DPs just can't do it by themselves. There's just there's too much money involved. It's just too complicated. They don't really have the ability to do that anymore just because things are so expensive and the millions of dollars that are being spent in pictures mm -hmm. just preclude that kind of approach. I mean, I think those days are gone. If you don't have a visual director who's interested in telling the story with pictures, DPs will never get it done as well uh, as they can. You know, as they, they just cannot muscle it through by themselves. They just can't basically take over a picture anymore. It just doesn't get done that way. You know, you got to work with people. Okay, so you, uh, on this show, you use a lot of uh, light, sunlight, uh, did you use reflectors, shinies, no. HMIs to, to fill it up? Not much. No. Not, not much fill at all. If I used fill, it would be just uh, soft fill, muslins on frames, you know, very soft. And the whole idea was to make it look as natural as possible. I, 
And if we had heavy contrast, I would use just a little bit of fill, but mostly exposed into the shadows mm -hmm. because it was just the, the natural ambience that I was that I wanted to uh, photograph. It wasn't, I didn't want the light to feel controlled. And I just find that as soon as you turn on a light outside, no matter how diffused it is, in my mind, it looks like a light. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I use light, I would, I would bounce light outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, either natural bounce or bounce HMIs into something. Mm -hmm. At times we had to do a lot of that because, for cosmetic reasons, and because essentially this was a romance. Yeah, to make the women look good. Yeah, and not the women, not only the women, but Brad Pitt too. Sure. And uh, Brad sometimes takes a lot of work. You know, it's just uh, he looks. You know, he's a great looking guy, but sometimes he takes a lot of work. Okay, let's let's get more into those dagger tricks. Uh, uh, you've got a, a, a close-up of Brad uh, um, in day exterior. You want to make him look uh, sexy and good. What do you do? Well, you make you you light him very much like a leading lady, uh -huh. you know? and, and there's nothing feminine about Brad, but uh, that's sometimes the treatment. There was one particular sequence in the picture when he's uh, this tennis game. He's having a conversation with his brother about uh, Susanna, the girl, and. Uh, the day before we shot that sequence, we shot a fight sequence, and Brad got hit. Uh, he got hit in the eye by accident. It's a sequence where he gets clubbed with a blackjack, mm -hmm. and the actor who uh, was doing the clubbing was supposed to hit miss, and he hit him. Oh. And he hit him in the eye. Ouch! And uh, he had a black eye, and his face was really puffy. This whole side of his face was very puffy. And this is a part of the story where it was the beginning of the story, and he was supposed to. Look as good as he looks. So and it was an exterior sequence, so it wasn't like we could completely control the light because it was, you know, we had half of Alberta as the background in mm -hmm. the Rocky Mountains. So uh, complete control was, on quite, or was out of the question. So we just had to use an enormous amount of uh, soft fill and just really fill it in. And it was just, uh, it just took an enormous amount of work. And very carefully, just adding uh, uh, increasing levels of, of fill to eliminate some of the the bad stuff in his face, some of the lines, some of the shadows. He had some bad bags. You know, he didn't sleep that night. He was in a lot of pain, and uh, so it was just a slow, very slow uh, way of inching our way forward. And what we wound up doing actually is we makeup gave him a cut. He didn't really have a cut. He had a black eye, but we gave him a cut. To just the curse off the right, and that other part. yeah, Good. and that kind of helped just sort of divert your attention just enough to sort of justify anything that looked a little weird about his face because his face was swollen, and uh, <laughs> you know, so that was okay. So, so the process was uh, you you got on the set line with the shot, and just as the rehearsals went on, you start kept adding uh, light to, to well, the only line. as as we needed. I mean, each individual sequence, of course, has its own you know has its own particular. Uh, Characteristic and, and needs, and I, I wanted to light as little as I could, only because that's the style, the photographic style that I determined uh, which was going to work for this picture. And sometimes we had to light an enormous amount and do a lot of work just to make it look like we weren't doing anything because the light wasn't particularly interesting. You know, the mm -hmm. light would be flat, so we'd have to try and add contrast uh, or take away light to add contrast, which we did actually as much as lighting. You know, did did lighting. you do a lot of early morning and late afternoon? Uh, we did a lot of late afternoon. We could never get it, we never, could never get it together for early morning, especially well in Canada, early morning is 5 a.m. Yeah. So, but what would happen is uh, we wind up shooting a long time, a lot of hours. And uh, well, Canada in the summertime, you got sun until 10 at night. Right. Yeah. And so what would happen is we wouldn't design necessarily design sequences to be shot at Magic Hour. I mean, there were some sequences designed to be shot at Magic Hour, but it wasn't the kind of situation where we'd sit around and wait for the light to get good. We'd shoot all day long. We would just shoot more than one sequence. Yeah. And, and we'd start, when there were a lot of sequences that were shot middle of the day. It wasn't like we were all, you know, let's wait for the good light and, you know, we have the luxury of sitting around waiting for good light. The schedule was so crammed. I mean, it was unbelievably crammed. It was a long schedule. But we had a lot of work to do. It was close to a television base, mm -hmm. this picture. Mm -hmm. And there's 45 minutes of cut picture that's not in this movie. Ooh, so, so, there's a, so there's a lot, it was, it was a lot of work. So 
we shoot all day long. We come to work, you know, we get there within 15, 20 minutes, we have a first setup, hopefully within an hour we'll be shooting. So it wasn't unlike a lot of television that everybody's done. And it was just trying to make that amount of work fit into those amount of days in a way that was visually interesting. And that was the whole one of the other. All right, it's high noon. You've got to make a sequence work. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have the pretty light of uh, magic hour or late mm -hmm. afternoon or anything like that to help you mm -hmm. along. What do you do? Put your butterflies up? So well, I, no. I basically, I would go with it. And what I would, what I would attempt to do, uh, and that was part of the scheduling, was to shoot sequences that would lend itself to that kind of light. Mm -hmm. And avoid shooting uh, the sequences that I felt required better light. Mm -hmm. Like, it, for example, there's a sequence at the graveyard where Aidan Quinn and, and uh, uh, Julia Armand have a conversation. And we basically shot, you know, it was like a 10 o'clock call in the morning, and we were shooting by noon, and we shot all the wide shots. Contrast the stark overhead light. Stark overhead light. But so the light wasn't happening, so I knew that in order to make the shot interesting, it had to be compositionally, the composition had to take over the shot. So when the light wasn't working, you really had to work harder for composition because uh, that was what was going to give you your best shot at making an interesting frame. So it's kind of evaluating, okay, what are, this, what, what are my choices? I, uh, the light is kind of like not happening, so let's make it the most interesting frame possible. Shoot the wide shots at this time of day because uh, the tight shots are going to look awful in this top light. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really want to go into completely controlling the tight shots in, in midday light because I knew that the natural light later in the day would lend themselves to the close-ups. Mm -hmm. And basically, so what I did in sequence is shot all the wide shots in the most graphic, wide frames uh, possible. And then went into coverage when... Yeah, the light fell by, down. Yeah, by the time we got done with that, the light had improved. And then basically shot their close-ups in backlight and shot everybody in backlight and would find a background that lent itself to a close-up because at that point, the wide shots were about where they were in this unbelievably beautiful location, which is the first time you saw the graveyard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so make that look as interesting as possible. And the close-ups were just about their conversation. At that point, the background was meaningless. So I found dark backgrounds that were... You go for a real big cheat, go to a whole different place to... Uh, well, but just turn them around. Turn them around, so okay. Just find the best background possible because mm -hmm. it didn't matter what the background mm -hmm. was. It was mm -hmm. just basically forest. Out of focus stuff and yeah, forest. Out of, for, out of trees, out of right. focus forest. Okay. And I had one direction that was backlit that had a great out of focus dark forest in the background. So that became the background for everybody. Perfect. In this case, it was only two people. Yeah. So it was basically put them in that background, have them look on the left side of the camera, put them in the same background, have them look on the right side of the camera. And then he moves around during the scene, and so, okay, so he moves out of that shot and reframe, and he moves into, you know, so it's basically the same background. It doesn't matter, because it's not about the background at that point. It's about the pieces. Yeah. So, yeah. That, and that's, that was pretty typical of uh, the general approach to the film. And so, make the most beautiful wide shot you can find, put him in a beautiful environment. And then, and the nature of the film was about people standing around talking to one another, uh, you know, a lot. So put them in a beautiful setting, and then let them talk in close up in the best possible light we could find, whether that meant manipulating available light or just shooting available and, and, light. And, and you didn't, but the, the call there was, oh, you crossed the line, or you've... you've oh, we never crossed the line. We no, just, no, just cheated the, the background. Cheated the background. Yeah, but the call is, oh, you moved the background, you know, you moved the light and said, so yeah, that doesn't make any difference. Who cares? Okay. You know, they look uh, good. It's just a lesson. You know, but I did that constantly in this film, and especially with Brad and Julia, because they needed it. You know? And so, uh, you know, I mean, there are purists who say, well, you know, he's in back play, she's in back play, when I'm supposed to be in front Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Who cares? I don't, you know, especially in this film. Yeah. You know, it's like, who Romance. cares? You know? Romance. Yeah, exactly. So, well, that, that's what we did. Just this one observation sounds like by being able to get into the early pre-planning and by able to design, help design the show, you really made it better, a lot better. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. I mean, from my point of view, too. I mean, I I like to look at this film. I love to go see it. I go. I love to go see it in a theater because it essentially is what I saw when I read the book, 
and uh, I just enjoy looking at the film. I mean, people have problems with this film as a film, and I certainly understand some of the, uh, uh, the critique of the film, but uh, in terms of the way it looks, I am more than happy with it, and uh, I'm very proud of it. They, they don't come around that often that, uh, uh, yeah. that you're happy with something. And truly, I mean, and, and, and seriously, and I think what's important in this is, it was only possible because of my collaboration with the director and his, uh, basically he would go along with everything that I wanted to do and I would suggest a certain type of staging or he would have an idea for staging and we would adapt it to the particular characteristics and, and the circumstances of the set and the weather and what was happening with the light and he basically, we just, we worked together on it. It was wonderful collaboration. Listen, we jumped ahead, uh, way ahead, right. to to uh, your your movie, uh, right. Legends of the Fall. But we, let's get back to what we were talking about—the historical sequence. We left off, kind of. You were you're still operating, uh, and uh, you've been. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're, we're talking. Let's let's get a time sequence here, like uh, about what years we're talking about. Early '70s. By this point, you're you're operating <coughs> a lot of big movies, and you're you work yeah. with Alonzo, and you're working with Jordan, and you're working with. Uh, yeah, we're into the '80s, and so what happened is, so I did like uh, yeah. like work with John, and then worked with Ray, and then along uh, in this period of time, I met Alan Davio on a TV movie. I interspersed with all this feature work. I've, I've been done, doing a lot of television with other guys. I worked with Tak Fujimoto mm -hmm. and uh, David Myers on some TV movies, and you know, just working a lot as an operator. And I uh, was introduced to Alan Davio by a director. And this was Alan. Alan did a picture called The Boy Who Drank Too Much. It was a TV movie. It was his first uh, union, long-form picture. With a, the director was an old friend of his, and he, uh, they had been dying to work together. Alan was having trouble getting in the union, they, you know, all that business. So he finally got in the union, and he did this uh, TV movie, CBS. And the director was named Jerry Friedman, who I worked with on, on two other television films. And, uh, and that was the whole thing with me as an operator. I was always, I've always got along with directors because that was just part of the process. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jerry recommended me to Alan because he didn't, Alan didn't have an operator. So uh, worked with Alan, we got along great, we had a great time. Uh, oh, it's so tough to get along. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, but, it was, but nobody, you know, I didn't know Alan. Yeah. Nobody knew Alan. Nobody knew, I, you know, I, I ran into John Bailey and after I'd been working with Alan, I said, oh yeah, I met this guy named Alan Davio. And John said, who? You know, who's that? You know? I said, oh, he's a great guy. And John said, oh, we'll, we'll probably hear more of him. You know? So this is like uh, 1979, 80. And uh, so then Alan gets E.T. Because he had known Stephen from, you know. Early days. Early days Amblin. And Stephen kept telling him, yeah, I'm going to give you a break, give you a break. So Alan takes a copy of The Boy Who Drank Too Much to Stephen. And, and Stephen said, hey, i got this other picture coming up, you know, it's a pretty small movie, and, and uh, he had offered to Bill Fraker, and Bill, I think, was directing The Lone Ranger, and he couldn't do it, and it was E.T. Yeah. So, yeah, and so I had, <laughs> I had uh, been friends with Alan, but Alan had gone off and done some other things, and had established a relationship with John Fleckenstein and Steve Shaw, and that was his A-camera crew at that time, and so Alan asked me to, if I wanted to do the second unit that John Stevens was shooting. And so I worked on the second unit of ET as an operator. Great. And about the end of that, Alan comes up to me one day and he says, Stephen wants to shoot a documentary about the making of ET. And so they're looking for somebody to do it. And he wants to do it in 35 millimeter. Because Stanley Kubrick's daughter had done a 35 millimeter documentary on the making of The Shining. And so Stephen figured, well, if Kubrick can do it, I can do it. You know? So Kathy Kennedy, uh, came to me and said, well, we want to do it, but we don't have a lot of money, so, you know, can you come in periodically and do these? So I said, hey, great. Okay, so I came in, uh, got a Panaflex, came in and started shooting a 35 millimeter documentary about the making of ET. Wonderful. At the same time, you did the second unit. second unit was over, so I had this time. Yeah. And in their minds, you know, in Kathy's mind, we, you know, we're going to come in for five to six days, just shoot a lot of material, have it around in case somebody wanted to come. So I said, great, sounds like fun. I would come in with an assistant cameraman, Tony Rivetti worked on it with me some of the time, and a lot of different guys. And uh, 
So I come in and do that completely on my own because it wasn't no no director. I would just shoot it. I'd have an assistant, have a sound man, and came in and started doing it. And after a while, it was sort of like it was really interesting. Number one, the picture, to, to say the least, was was interesting to be around. Stephen is always an interesting character. The photograph, he kind of like loves to have a documentary camera around because he you know gives him a diffusion. He gets the play with it basically as an actor. You know? So this sort of this project kind of took a life of its own. You know, I kind of like. The more I got into it, the more days we figure out how to shoot. Kathy, we keep going to Universal, getting more money. And I wound up shooting like a lot of days. Like, you know, most of the time I was around shooting this 35 millimeter documentary on the set. You know, so I had a great time doing it. We're diverting a little bit anyway. But that's anyway, that's how I met Alan. So, and, and the whole point is, I, after a while, I broke away from John. Uh, you know, he went off and did his thing. I wanted to do this documentary with uh, Alan and, or, and, and E.T. And, had the opportunity to work with a lot of other guys. So I worked with Alan after ET. Alan asked me to do the Falcon and the Snowman with John Schlesinger as the director. Mm -hmm. uh, came back from that to that. Had the, John Schlesinger recommended me to another director, Carol Rice, who uh, was talking to Robbie Greenberg. And so I got the opportunity to do Sweet Dreams with mm -hmm. uh, Robbie. And uh, had also sort of like, at the same time, in between all these features, I've been working Commercials had met Jordan, running with doing uh, commercials. Mm -hmm. Jordan asked me to do uh, a feature he was doing, and so I was just getting a lot of experience with some really great cameramen. Uh, did, uh, did two pictures with Jordan, one of which was with Francis Coppola uh, as a director, and then uh, at that time was recommended to Conrad Hall who had not done features for about 10 years, decided he wanted to do a feature, came in, he was coming back to do Black Widow, and uh, did Black Widow with Conrad. So in the space of a few years, I just- well, You worked with all the guys, I mean, yeah. the, the top photographers. No, it was wonderful, and, and, and these guys were like, I mean, they're not just good cinematographers, I mean, they're great guys, they're great people to work with, they're great uh, you know, leaders of the team, you know, and, and all with, completely different personalities, completely different approaches to work, and uh, all great guys, and, and uh, you just acquire, you know, just through that exposure, you just acquire such a, uh, just an appreciation for uh, ways of going about doing things. And it's not like, you know, I'm not going to go in and try and light a scene like Jordan, you know, did this, or Alan would do it that way, or Conrad does it this way, but you just understand that uh, there's a lot of different ways to get there, and uh, it's really what happens once you get there that counts, not really necessarily how, how you go about doing it. And because uh, they've all got you know completely different approaches to work, and my approach is completely different from theirs in terms of you know how you lay, how you lay out, what you do. But uh, it was just wonderful having the opportunity to work with all these guys. But you're watching their styles, you're watching their techniques now. Yeah, but it, more than techniques, it's, it's just sort of about a personal kind of approach. You uh -huh. know, and not specifically about technical things, you know, just in terms of the whole kind of like life experience with these guys, you know, especially with a guy like Conrad, who is kind of like, is truly, you know, an artist in terms of, I mean, he actually lives and he breathes his work, you know, and he, you know, that's it, it just kind of takes over his life and, and uh, so just having the opportunity to be exposed to that is just kind of like affirming because it's, I mean, I think it's in all of us and, and when you get around somebody who can actually kind of let it go and, 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 and just kind of allow it to flow through him, which is what he does, he just sort of like, you know, he lets the story kind of flow through him and kind of like what comes out is his interpretation of it and it's always different. None of his pictures look the same. Uh, and he couldn't, you know, sit down and articulate why he did something, you know, it just sort of happens, you know, he's sort of the conduit for it, you know, and he's just kind of this wonderful, he's an artist. And uh, just uh, having the opportunity to watch him do that, it just sort of reaffirms that uh, as a general approach, you know, like, he follows his intuition, he lets it happen, and, uh, when I became a director of photography, it was it was great for me to have that uh, exposure and just an understanding that, yes, in fact, 
it's okay, it's gonna work out, just do what you think, and basically, you know, forget it, don't look back. Well, how did it happen that you moved up to officially director of Well, fortunately, I was, I was doing a picture with Conrad, and fortunately, he got fired on it. Ooh. it was, <laughs> that's, actually, it was fortunate for everybody. Because he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to be there. The director didn't want him to be there. Uh, I didn't want to be there because I was because I was uh, uh, watching him suffer through it. Oh boy! And by getting fired, he became available to do a picture that he really wanted to do. There you go. So we got fired on Scrooge. Oh, I or, heard about Scrooge. You know, <laughs> he like, complained about Scrooge. For, you know. For no good reason other than basically, you know, it was like watching people in a bad marriage, you know, and it's like we all should have known better going in. It sounded, you know, it was like classic. It really sounded like a good idea. After about 10 minutes, everybody figured, you know, everybody realized what an awful idea it was. And uh, so, you know, so everybody, you know, so, the, so Conrad got fired because he was slow, which was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, he was like, he was doing a fantastic job. The picture looked really good. Uh, it was just kind of like a personality problem, you know, between him and Dick Donner. Mm -hmm. you know? And and Dick wanted somebody else to do the picture who wasn't available. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of was recommended by the production designer. Dick said, "Okay, great." And once they got on, it was just sort of like, uh, you know, they didn't get along these guys, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got fired. So. But what happened is, he became available to do Tequila Sunrise. And if he hadn't got fired, he wouldn't have been available to do it. He wound up getting the ASC Award and getting nominated for an Academy Award for Tequila, which, and he was much happier doing it. He had a great time working with Robert Town. Uh, and what happened to you? I went out and started shooting commercials because when oh, I- Oh, you left the show too, at that point? Yeah, okay. when Conrad got fired. Yeah, it was like pointless. Well, well okay. I mean, you started to see yeah, I was working for the director of photography. You know? sure. I, I, I was working, I was always working for the DP. Sure. I don't go to work for the producer or the director. I was working for the DP. And it was, it was stupid why I got fired anyway. I mean, I didn't want to be there. So um, there was a director, Robbie Greenberg recommended, recommended me to shoot a series of commercials for a director that he had been working with. And uh, so two weeks after I got fired on Scrooge, I was in the Caribbean shooting these uh, cruise line commercials. Oh, a nice shift of months. years. Nice shift right. of years. Yeah, and I, by, and I sent Dick Donner a little Polaroid saying thank you very much. You know. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I went off and did these commercials and as a DP. And because it, at the time, see, all, parallel with all, these, all this feature work as an operator, I was looking for an opportunity to do something as a DP. And it would be something more than, you know, just bad, a bad uh, low budget feature. You know, I just, I couldn't get into it. I mean, the work that I was doing was so good. I was working with really good DPs. I was working with good directors. It's kind of like, I'd much rather have stayed an operator forever than start doing schlock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't like, I wanted to be a DP, but it wasn't at all costs, you know. And uh, what had happened simultaneously with all this is this is sort of like the, the era of the uh, uh, foreign DPs coming in shooting low budget or medium budget non-union movies. The, the movies the, you'd like to move up on. And, well, traditionally the movies that an operator had the opportunity to move up on were no longer available to first time DPs. And like when David Walsh or, or Fraker or any of these guys moved up, you know, all the, uh, all the operators. Awesome. Were, and, yeah, all these guys. But whatever, but those pictures were no longer viable for first time DPs. Right, they'd hire a Brit right. or, or an Australian right. or, because, or a German or Yeah, or because else. they could hire very qualified directors of photography guys who uh, were doing very good work, who had done 10 or 15 features. So uh, just from a producer's point of view, it was much safer to hire a guy with 10 or 15 features behind him who had demonstrated that he could do good work. Even if you need a translator, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, from their point of view, plus, and there was a whole economical thing, they could, what it allowed them to hire non-union crews, and that's how that whole non-union feature film industry came into existence, because they could hire directors of photography who had experience. That's, that was the origin of the, uh, basically that's why the union is still in trouble, because we, we just allowed that to happen. And everybody looked the other way. We were all working. Nobody 
gave a shit. John Alcott came in, came in and did a picture called Vice Squad in Hollywood with a non-union crew, and nobody gave a shit, basically. All right? John Alcott was a wonderful cameraman. There was no reflection on the ability of these guys and their work. It was just basically uh, us, our union, allowing a non-union industry to come into existence. And the way that happened is because we didn't allow these people in the union. So we refused to let them be in the union. Mm -hmm. If we had opened the doors a lot earlier, there would be no non-union film industry today because everybody would be in the union. And I think that the idea is to not keep people out of the union, but to have everybody in the union. If you have everybody in the union, you don't have a non-union industry. And because we were so stupid for so long, and so blind, and so protective of uh, trying to keep our, preserve our jobs, that we basically lost our jobs by trying to protect them. And that's what happened. And, and I, I could see it. it was a direct result of allowing all these non-union uh, DPs into the country, because these are the guys that I was competing with. So mm -hmm. I was painfully aware of what was going on. On. So you you were watching the the bread snatch right from your mouth as yeah I mean I would go I would go interview for jobs I, I I went on a job interview I went to interview for the same job that Mikhail Solomon did the first job that he did in this country was a TV movie uh, it was a remake of uh, uh, it was a fugitive from a chain gang mm -hmm. Mikhail got the job hey if I was the producer I would have hired Mikhail too because he was doing wonderful work he's a great cameraman uh, he had a history of you know. I mean, I don't know how many pictures he shot, 20 or 30 pictures. Of, of course you'd hire a guy with that kind of experience. Yeah, but in Poland. No, well, it, you know, it, it, from Europe. But it's yeah. like, and I don't begrudge these guys for coming here working, you know. If the film industry was in, you know, Paris, and I was an American and we didn't have a film industry, I'd want to go to Paris and work, you know. I, you can't begrudge these guys for coming here to work. Yeah. You know, I have no problem with these guys working. Yeah. Right. But put them in the union, yeah. you know. And so then, you know, basically, so it's an equal, it's an equal playing field, mm -hmm. you know. So, and I would go interview for jobs and be told that because I was in the IA, I could not be not considered for work. Ooh. I was told that many times because I was, and then uh, the, in order to qualify for the job, you have to quit the union and become a uh, financial, financial board, core, yeah. which I was not prepared to do. I still believe in the IA as an entity. I believe in, the, you know, in, in maintaining the union and all things that the union stands for. And I think that basically the financial core is uh, essentially something that really goes against their interests. So I would not participate in it, and it prevented me from getting a lot of jobs. I mean, I literally would have people tell me, yeah, uh, we really think you can do the job, but all you have to do is go financial core. And I, I heard you had another name that you were going to name yourself. Uh, it was always a joke. that uh, <laughs> would come up with uh, the name of Giovanni Tolini or... Jan Van Tol Jan Van as a way of basically uh, 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 convincing people that uh, I wasn't American, which was always a joke. I never seriously considered it. But I mean, it was so stupid that, I mean, that, it was getting down to that. Yeah. And that uh, if you show up with a foreign sounding name, you automatically were overqualified over for the job. If, it was, if you were an IA operator, then obviously you couldn't be qualified for it. You know? I mean, it was, you know, that was the mentality. So you had to fight your way through this? And how did you break out? To well, I just, then basically, I just kept operating. I just, I, you know, then fortunately, I can consider myself to be very fortunate that uh, Alan Davio or Conrad or Jordan, uh, one of these guys would call and say, hey, listen, I got a movie you want to do it. And I said, yeah, good, you know, because because of Paul Hall, I wanted to be working on features. I wanted to be making films. And if I couldn't do it as a DP, then I was more than happy to do it uh, as an operator on the particular types of films that these I was getting calls. So we're starting to talk about great movies. I mean, there was no yeah, so no bottom movie. line, that's why I'm here. I want to, I want to make good films. Yeah. You know? And if, uh, I didn't want to go work on slasher films as a DP because uh, if you happen to get the credit of the DP, that really wasn't as important to me as, as doing something that I felt good about. Mm -hmm. So when we got fired on Scrooge, uh, Robbie just about forced me. He says, go do these commercials, you know, and because uh, this director had asked him to do it, and he was doing something else. And uh, so I went off and did it. And that went relatively well. And so I got back and met an agent, my agent, whose name is Judy Marks, who was a woman who had come out of the advertising industry who was setting up an agency. And uh, she was looking for DPs to sign. And her emphasis was commercials. And I said, well, 
I had a commercial reel. I gave Judy my reel. I said, great, if you can get me some work, I'm your client. She said, great. She took the reel, got some work. I started shooting commercials. And she kept getting me work. She was uh, the best thing that ever happened to me in terms of making that transition to, uh, from operator to DP. And I started shooting commercials. And basically kept busy doing it. And started doing interesting commercials. Uh, things that were very visual, this, like the, uh, the job that I did in the Caribbean. We did a very similar job with that in Alaska. A few months after that, I spent like a month in Alaska shooting. Oh, well, shooting the water has got a, uh, it's a bit of a trick. Yeah, shooting the water and shooting beautiful exteriors and landscapes, which eventually got me uh, a job working with Carol Ballard and doing a commercial. And Carol is the director of Black Stallion. Huh? And uh, he, he had been doing a lot of commercials. He had been trying to get a feature together. And it was, sort of was on, it was off, it was on, it was off. So, He'd been doing commercials, and he saw my commercial reel with all of these exteriors, and it's something certainly that Carol could relate to. His films are about beautiful environments and people in the environments, and he saw these Alaska commercials and hired me to do a car commercial he was doing. So we're doing this car commercial, and we're working in Boston. And we wrap the job, and we're going home, and I get on the plane to come home, and Carol just coincidentally happened to be on the plane. So I sat with Carol on his flight to Boston, to LA, and he told me about this picture that he was going to do about sailboat racing. And uh, he thought it was going to happen, and he heard that it was, they were close to going, and they were going to go to Australia and do this, and he was talking to some Australian DPs about shooting it. And he's telling me about this picture, and I'm thinking, God, that sounds like, really, it's going to be tough, you know? They're, you know it was a movie about America's Cup Yacht Racing, Wind. And uh, he proceeds to tell me the story, his plan for doing it, and that he had been talking to a couple of different guys. I think he was, he'd been talking to John Seal, I think, and Dean Simler. And he thought one of those guys was going to be available to do it. As it turned out, neither one of them were. But I didn't know this at the time. And this was like September. And so in the process, you know, we sat there, we drank a bottle of wine, got kind of drunk on the plane. I told Carol about the E.T. documentary and basically, you know, we just talked for about five hours. He's a great guy and I loved his pictures. I thought Black Stanley was wonderful. Black Stanley is the kind of picture that I wanted to be doing, you know, just that kind of cinematography and the kind of visual storytelling. And Carol was a guy who I'd always admired, you know, and Never Cry Wolf, which I thought was unbelievable. So we got off the plane. Carol said, well, you know, I got to go to Australia scouting pretty soon. You know, maybe we'll catch up and do something and blah, blah, blah. And I thought that would be great. And I'm, and I'm walking away thinking, Jesus, that picture's really going to be hard, you know. And those Australian DPs really have their hands full, and, but they're probably the right guys. He was going to shoot in Australia. So, blah, blah, blah. Five months later, I get a phone call from Carol that none of the Australians are available. Do I want to go to Australia next week and start shooting wind? <laughs> Wonderful. So it was kind of like, oh yeah, no problem. I hung up the phone and thought, fuck, what am I going to do with this? What, what, what can we, how are we going to do this? Because I had very little, really little experience on the water and on a sailor. The, uh, I've had some experiences on boats that weren't particularly enjoyable. And, uh, you know, in all my mind, in my mind, I might not, you know, they have been, been incapacitated, you know, the first day, you know. Hang it over the rail, seasick. So, old navy man that you are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, off we go to Western Australia. Hire all the Australian crew. You know, basically just, you know, just off you go. Pick up, pick up everybody over there and shake hands and off we go. And uh, it worked out very well. And and that's another picture I'm particularly proud of. And. Uh, well, you made a, a sailboat racing, which can be, shall we say, boring looking yeah. visually. Uh, jump it! It uh, you really made something happen with it. Uh, I know that a lot of the staging, of course, but uh, you know the the, and the action of what they're doing. But you know the, that, that picture had a lot of very pretty visuals, and yeah. it was all handheld, and you were doing uh, a tremendous amount of stuff on the boat, and I, well, I, I thought it was wonderful. Yeah, and that and, and Carol certainly deserves also director and Carol Allen also deserves an enormous amount of uh, credit for that because uh, we very quickly came to the realization even before we started shooting that 
it was basically pick up the camera and do it. I mean, you know, all the rigs in the world were completely meaningless on these boats. They're, they're very wet boats. Uh, there's no room on them. Toss you around. Um, they're designed for racing, not for photo photography. Uh, there's physically no room on the boat for much else other than the people who are sailing it. Yeah, it's completely designed to take 11 people in very specific positions and uh, anything in terms of more bodies or gear is like just in the way. So it was, it was essentially, uh, what's that? Ten minutes left. Ten minutes left. Yeah, we got, we got okay. a lot. We've done a lot here. It's right. rolling along very quickly. Okay. So uh, you, you worked on it uh, uh, for how long did that movie take you? Six months. Whoa. And it was, it was at the beginning we really were kind of like had to feel our way. We, Carol and, and I both knew that uh, a lot of it would have to be handheld. And we were able to get two 35mm Aton cameras, which had been used in some films before that, but not a lot. You know, in, in our minds, it was a big experiment. If nothing else, Carol owned four CM3 Eclair cameras that, as a backup, that's what we were going to use to photograph it with. And just because of sheer weight and size of the camera, we knew that uh, anything else was out of the question. You know, like a Panaflex or a BL, it was sync sound. Mm -hmm. And so we needed a, we needed a sync sound camera and uh, a Panaflex or a BL or anything like that. It was like... A lot, of, a lot of weight, a lot more weight than Just out of the question. It was yeah. impossible on these boats because of the amount of movement and the, mm -hmm. the, the severity of uh, how much they leaned over. I mean, just basically sailing conditions. So the whole objective of that picture was to put the audience on the boat. I mean, that was the uh, uh, basic photographic approach to that picture was to make the audience a participant in the race. And um, we essentially shot a documentary. It was a controlled documentary about these crews sailing their boats. I mean, essentially, that's what, that was the photographic approach to the, to the racing. And because we had the 35 millimeter Aton, which is really not much bigger than the 16 millimeter version, it had uh, it's uh, the Aton time code system, which allowed us to shoot without slates, mm -hmm. still stay in sync. Uh, it basically made all that possible, and it was certainly Carol's uh, uh, understanding and and uh, photographic knowledge uh, that just made it real easy for me to uh, accomplish that. Wonderful. So you did that movie in Australia. It came out, it wasn't a, a huge financial success, but it certainly put your name on the map, mm -hmm. visually. Well, it just, it just opened doors. It just, it, it basically, now I was a feature DP. I had shot a feature that was visually interesting. So I was automatically, uh, automatically had access to interviews. I didn't necessarily get work out of it. But what it did was people would take me serious when I walked in the door and sat down and yeah, had a conversation. Arms, hey, look at this. Right. You know? yeah. So, I mean, it's just, that's the process. And that wasn't that long ago that you did Mint. It was shot in 91, it was released in 92. And uh, I actually had other offers to uh, do jobs, which I turned down after Mint because I wanted to be around for when lab, when wind got to the lab so I could time it. Mm -hmm. So it could look the way I wanted it to look and not just basically turn it over. Because we shot in Australia, we shot in Newport, Rhode Island, we shot in Hawaii. Uh, Big worldwide movie. The work print was a mess. I needed to be around and it can hit the lab so I could basically make the movie look like I wanted to look in, in timing for the answer for timing. Well, so, at the SOC screen that you, you showed us, I thought it looked just marvelous. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you did to it. Right. It well, I just basically made it look like I wanted it to look when I shot it, not someone else's interpretation like the editor or, you know, uh, the color timer at the lab, no matter how good he is. It's like, it's not. His interpretation would be my interpretation. The other way, it's not. I wanted it to look like I wanted it to look, not like somebody else would try to interpret my look. So basically, I stuck around for that, kept shooting commercials, stayed busy, and uh, got the opportunity to shoot Legends of the Fall. So that was the next movie that you really yeah. picked up on after after Wind. Really, was this is your second feature that you second feature uh, that you achieved uh, all this right. recognition for? Mm -hmm. Well. You spent years apprenticing with all these great folks and you know, picking up on what they were doing, so it's not, it's not that unusual, but uh, this day and age, you know, a lot of people seem to get in line ahead of our 
American cinematographer, so I'm real pleased you got that. Part. Yeah, well, more than enthusiastic about it. Yeah. So this is this is where you're at now, 1995. Right. Um, you're you're off looking for new projects. Yeah, I did a film earlier in the year. There's a movie called Braveheart that Mel Gibson directed and starred in that I did last year with him in Scotland and Ireland. That's going to be released uh, Memorial Day weekend, 95. And I'm I'm in the lab doing that now, doing the timing on that. And that's uh, 13th century Scotland. Marvelous. So you're doing uh, period pieces now. You're getting all kinds of uh, new Big authors. Big epic. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, so anything's possible. It sounds like you're going to be just as busy as a director of photography as you were as an operator. That would be okay. Not bad, Nothing huh? Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Keep your agent busy, make a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we're, we're down to the point now uh, where, uh, Howie, uh, would you like to uh, uh, say a few words here? We just got about five minutes or less than that, three minutes before we have to wrap this one up. Well, we only have five minutes to ask you about 150 questions. Right. Yeah. You okay? Um, I will uh, be very brief. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of things, I mean, with Wind and with Legends of the Fall, they were both what you would call exterior pictures. We haven't uh, even touched on anything uh, technical yet. I was wondering what kind of film you chose and the filters of any and why. Uh, and uh, I used a little diffusion on Legends. Uh, just because I wanted to romanticize it a bit, and because of the uh, sometimes we were dealing with extremely contrasty light, which I wanted to soften, so I used uh, some rear nets and pro miss um, for all those reasons. Uh, I'm a real fan of 5247, and in fact, at the Kodak dinner uh, last Saturday, I uh, made a strong case for them to keep manufacturing 5247, which I know they're desperately trying to eliminate. And uh, because I, th I think it, I, I like it much better than 48. I think it's the blacks are richer, uh, the contrast is, uh, the uh, uh, colors aren't saturated. I love, I love the contrast. I just think it's a beautiful emotion, which I use a lot of that on Legends and the, the exteriors. On um, Wind, I use a lot of 52-45 for the uh, extremely contrasty daylight situations because I found that 45 is, uh, uh, has more latitude, especially in the shadows, if you expose into the shadows with 52-45, the highlight range is almost unlimited. It's almost impossible to overexpose 52-45 in contrasty situations, and I found it particularly useful on wind, where there was, we couldn't, we, we couldn't do any lighting at all on the boats. I mean, it was completely uncontrolled. And so I would just expose into the shadows, and it worked wonderfully. That's great. So I remember I operated for many years for Harry Wolf, who was a great cameraman. Yeah. And he told me, uh, taught me, he said, expose for the shadows, kid, and let the highlights take care of themselves. No, that's exactly what yeah. I mean. And especially in both these pictures, really. I mean, I would underexpose the shadows a bit on Legends, but I, mean, I always knew where, I mean, I think that's where it's at. You, you just really want to, you have to know where the shadows are. And it's all about, because I love contrast, but you can't have contrast without shadow detail. You have to have shadow detail with contrast, and it's about, I think the whole key is knowing where your shadows are and having the amount of shadow detail that you want. Okay, very quickly now. We're running out of time. Yeah, well, now very quickly now. Any uh, advice for youngsters coming into business today? Yeah, I would take a different approach than I did. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go through this long a period of time of learning your craft. There's a lot more opportunities today to learn your craft uh, faster, quicker than I did. I would uh, try to shoot much earlier on in the chain, uh, shoot commercials, shoot documentaries, get your hand on cameras and expose film any way you can. That sounds great. Hey, I got to do this. I'm going to, for a finish, oh, this is heavy. Put this in your lap. Um, look at you know, There's no one else I'm going to embarrass by doing this, uh, but that's terrific. I think it's a great little, little cameo bit this for our end. There you go. And uh, that's, that's what you get at the end of the line, huh? Yeah. Now I can relax. <laughs> <laughs> You've proven it, huh? It's the best thing about getting one of these is you can relax. You don't have to think about it much anymore. Great. It'd be great to get more than one, and I certainly wouldn't turn it down. But uh, it really is. I mean, you don't have to have a sense of frustration. Hey, am I ever, ever going to get the opportunity to do this? Uh, having 
gotten it out of the way, it's uh, uh, a wonderful feeling. Well, on that note, we're going to fade out, and we'll see you on the next one. Okay, great. Bye, Jeff. Thanks. See you in the movies. Okay. Great. 59, 42, 43. <laughs> right. Does it? Yeah, yeah. Very great.